Good afternoon. My name is Jay Goldstein, and I'd like to welcome you all to this, the 47th annual Ward World Championship Wildfowl Carving Competition, hosted by the Ward Museum of Wildfowl Art, a proud part of the Salisbury University in Salisbury, Maryland. We're here at the Performing Arts Center in the Ocean City Convention Center in Ocean City, Maryland. And this presentation that I was asked to give on behalf of the Ward Museum is Dynamic Symmetry in Fine Art Sculpture. And just as a reminder, this is a bird carving show, so there will inevitably be some remarks about bird carving. Uh, this presentation is being videotaped by the Salisbury area local public service television folks. And if anyone in the audience has any questions, I'll be very glad to do a one-on-one -on -one after the presentation. My goal here today is to acquaint everyone with the reality that for thousands of years, geometry played an important role, if not the key role, in the creation of both fine art and architecture. And I'll attempt to acquaint you with the basis of geometry and fine art and the terminology and language that we use regarding uh, dynamic symmetry. Again, my name is Jay Goldstein, and from 1997 to 2007, a period of about 10 years, I studied the use of geometry, the golden section, the use of dynamic symmetry with a very fine art instructor who focused on drawing by design. The instructor was a man named Myron Barnstone. The motto of the Barnstone Art Studio was that anyone could be taught to draw well, like an accomplished artist, and that was exactly what Mr. Barnstone did for anyone who came to him to learn how to draw. In the late 1950s, Barnstone was a young student at the Ruskin School of Drawing at Oxford, the University of Oxford in England, in the United Kingdom. Uh, Barnstone trained, as the other students did, under the tutelage of a, the highly regarded master of the Ruskin School at the time, a Mr. Percy Horton. Mr. Barnstone was elected president of the Ruskin's Sketch Club, and as a result, uh, he came to the attention of Mr. Horton, the master of the Ruskin, who happened to introduce Barnstone to the long lost practice of using geometry to create fine art, both two-dimensional and three-dimensional, to work in dynamic symmetry. Horton provided Barnstone with a good deal of reading materials on geometry and fine art on dynamic symmetry, including Andre Lotz Treatise on Landscape Painting, right here. From that moment on, Mr. Barnstone literally spent his life studying the use of dynamic symmetry and geometry and fine art in various cultures and throughout various periods. Uh, he worked uh, as a, an artist in Paris. He spent time in Spain and Portugal. I mean, he was just absolutely everywhere until he came back to this country and then uh, did a number of us a great favor. He opened up a, an art school where he taught us how to draw. So what is the theory behind geometry and fine art, the basis of dynamic symmetry, the use of the golden section in art? It's the belief that there must be some design and architecture in your art to make it fine art. And what happened to dynamic symmetry? Why isn't it aggressively taught and practiced today? Well, the modern art movement that blossomed in the early 1900s became the death knell to dynamic symmetry in fine art. The art community throughout the world on a whole seemed to just dismiss out of hand the idea that there had to be design, there had to be architecture in fine art. If you're interested in finding Andre Lotz's treatise on landscape painting, I suggest you contact the library of a college or university with a strong arts program. That's how I found a treatise. I searched for a long time on the internet and could not find it. There are two versions, by the way. There's a French version that was done around 1939, and then about 10 years later, there was the English version, which Percy Horton, the master of the Ruskin School, had helped to transcribe from the French, the original French, to the English. Um, as for the many books on geometry and fine art, and there are many, uh, all you have to do is go on the internet and search for dynamic symmetry and fine art or the geometry of fine art. Using those key words, you're going to find a lot of books. They seem to have one thing in common. I've bought some myself. And that is that if you don't have a strong background in mathematics, you're going to have a problem because they're, they're pretty in-depth when it comes to math and geometry especially. As for Mr. Barnstone, he closed his studio 
a few years ago, and he died during the past year. Uh, I'm quite frankly thrilled and deeply honored and genuinely humbled to note that I'm an elected professional sculptor member of the National Sculpture Society based in New York City. I was entered into the society in New York City in the class of 2010, just about seven years ago. Since the late 1800s, when the National Sculpture Society began, members of the society have included some of America's most important sculptors. Much of our coinage, our money, was designed early on by sculptors in the National Sculpture Society, 1900 through almost World War II. There are today about 250 living artists in America who are elected professional sculptor members of the National Sculpture Society, with about half of those having earned the additional title of fellow. Now, many of these sculptors prefer the mediums of metal, like bronze, and stone, like marble, and their styles of art seem to range from traditional realism to impressionism. Uh, I am best recognized today as a woodcarver, and my art is admittedly a bit abstract. So how is it that the society has been so kind in its view of my art that my sculpture has been received so well by individual members of the society when in their own art they lean towards metal and stone and not the abstract? I don't believe that the strength in my art, my talent uh, is as, as an artist, Rather, I believe that the strength of my sculpture is found in literally 20 years of training, use and reliance on the geometry of dynamic symmetry. It's all about the architecture in my art and not about the talent that I might have. And I'd like to note that there are architects in the National Sculpture Society as well as sculptors, and that it's likely because the National Sculpture Society, when it was first formed over 100 years ago, many in the worlds of art and architecture at that time still held a strong belief that there was a common thread in the fabric of art and architecture. Those who use dynamic symmetry, who draft and design their art, do so in rectangles, and so any discussion on dynamic symmetry must first begin with reviewing the prescribed rectangles, there are eight rectangles, that we work with. When we look at the first image that we have here, the source is Wikipedia, it, this is cuneiform, they're writing. For our purposes today, what these folks wrote almost 5,000 years ago, actually 4,600 years ago, um, believed to be, the writings are immaterial. What's important, there are three things here. Number one, they figured out how to create a 90 degree angle. Number two, they realized that to get the right kind of impact, they need to put it into rectangles. And number three, the rectangles are different sizes, just as we in dynamic symmetry work with eight rectangles. Um, these folks already figured out they wanted to do their work in rectangles and of different sizes. Ancient Egyptian architects figured out how to put squares, uh, 90 degree angles, on their pyramids. So how did they all figure this out? I asked Mr. Barnstone that one night, and what I'm about to show you is the standard 3-4-5 rule, they call it. And uh, he had a big smile on his face. He couldn't wait to show us how they did this. This rope is divided into 12 sections. It doesn't matter how long the section is. It could be the length of a hand, an arm, a shepherd's staff, or something even longer. Um, but right here, we've got the 90 degree angle right at this corner. And with that, we can make a square, we can make a rectangle, and we can begin to design. So there are eight rectangles in dynamic symmetry, the most prominent one being the golden section, also known as the golden mean, also occasionally referred to over hundreds of years as the divine proportion, also referred to as the... Um, the uh, rectangle of the whirling squares, and um, the Fibonacci number, the Fibonacci sequence, the Fibonacci series. Fibonacci was a 12th century mathematician and he felt that there should be a way to define the golden section, the rectangle of the whirling squares, with a sequence of numbers. 
and he did it. And so if you look on the internet, there's a very considerable amount of information on the golden mean, the um, uh, golden section, it all pretty much means the same thing. Gets you to the same place. Now, the rectangles that we use before we start drawing, we have eight of them. The first one we start with is the square. That's a root one rectangle. And to make the root two, we do not go to the art store and buy a pre-hung canvas. We do it this way. We gotta do it ourselves. Down like this. So we're taking the diagonal of a square and bringing it down. And then we bring that up. And that becomes our root two rectangle. To make the root three, we bring that diagonal down, bring that up. Oops. And that gives us the root three. There's then the root four, the diagonal, down, up, and that's the root four. Now there's an interesting characteristic about the root four. It's two squares side by side. When we want to make a canvas, we want to design something and we feel we select a rectangle, we can take multiples of that rectangle to get the right, the right area for design. This is what's known as stacking. When rectangles are put side by side. And there is such a thing as overlapping. So if this is a, say, a root three rectangle, we can overlap. So that's the root four. The root five is the root four. And that gives us the root five. Then there is the root 1.5 rectangle. The 1.5 is we take a square, we cut it in half, one half, one half, 1 1.5, 1 1.5 portions of a square. Then there's two more rectangles, and they are actually the most famous of the rectangles. As you look at the work of uh, master artists throughout the years, I've gone to museums, and uh, I have a, a plastic thing that shows the various axes, and I can see exactly what someone like Vincent van Gogh had designed a painting in, or Claude Monet, or da Vinci, or Michelangelo, or Caravaggio, or Titian, or whatever. Um, they would often work in the golden section rectangle. And that's achieved by taking the square, the square is right here, and then cutting the square in half. I'll do it over here. We cut the square in half like this, and we bring this down the diagonal, and that becomes the golden section rectangle, the golden mean, that's how easily we can manufacture this thing. That's the pi rectangle. The last rectangle is the root phi rectangle, and that's achieved by taking the phi rectangle 
and we take the baseline and we bring it up to where it touches the top and we bring that down and I've now created the root phi rectangle. Now I've recreated the uh, root phi, the, the phi rectangle, the golden section rectangle here. So this is the square. And when we bring a diagonal down here, and then we bring a diagonal down here, hitting it at a 90 degree angle, at this point, we draw a line across, we're repeating the square. Square, square, and then I bring a line down, I get another square, another square, another square, another square. And what do we have? We have the movement of a nautilus. We've been able to define a living creature based in the golden section. Now this has been defined as the divine proportion, not because necessarily we can define the activity of a seashell in this rectangle. Let me show you what else it defines. It defines us. This is the calipers for the golden section rectangle, the golden mean. So it's 1 to 1.618033988878, and I guess it's like pi. It just keeps flowing. And um, there's the digit and the whole finger. There's the finger to the hand. The hand to the arm, the head to my navel. The eye to the other side of the eye. The relationship is the same. The um, brow to the top of the head to the very part, the bottom of the chin. Our anatomy is defined by a golden section. This is the same piece of equipment, same definition. This was bought in a medical catalog that was intended for use by plastic surgeons reconstructing people's faces. So when Leonardo da Vinci referred to this as the divine proportion, we understand what he was talking about. This defines us as people, as human beings. Now having reviewed the rectangles, we move um, to designing in the rectangles and to do that, we have to establish theme. What is a theme? Theme is the necessary activity of taking the rectangle and breaking it up into design areas that can assist us in putting things in order and creating an architecture. A theme of three looks like a tic-tac-toe board. One, two, three, one, two, three. That's a theme of four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You take your finger, your thumb, and your forefinger, you put it on your chin, and you put it, the other finger under your nose like this. One. Now the thumb is where the forefinger was, and the finger is on the, my eyebrow. That's two. We go up one more, the thumb is now on my eyebrow, the finger is up at the top of my forehead. One, two, three. This distance from here to here is one. This is the exact same distance to here, which is the exact same distance to here. Our faces are constructed on the theme of three. With the relationship, the anatomical relationship is the golden section.
So this helps us to define areas where we're going to start to construct our drawing. Without design, there may be representation, but there can be no art. It's credited to a gentleman named Kenyon Cox, an American artist, 1856 to 1919. He was an American painter, illustrator. But one of the things that he did, interestingly, was that he was very involved in the Art Student League in New York City, and he helped to develop their motto, which is nulla dia sine linea, no day without a line. If you research on the internet the motto of the Art Student League, uh, what you learn is that the motto refers to a famous ancient Greek painter named Apelles, who was credited with claiming that no day should pass without an artist at least drawing a line to practice creating art. I believe that's a quote. So an artist is supposed to draw at least a line every day of their life. Is that what he was talking about? Or because Kenyon Cox was a disciple of design, was his motto, no day without a line, a hidden reference to the line of coincidence upon which there are points of coincidence. A key design element of dynamic symmetry in our drawing is the line of coincidence with points of coincidence. So now we'll review the line of coincidence and points of coincidence. This is a drawing that I did. The exercise was actually to try and understand horizontal lines and their impact. And I got the idea from, uh, we were doing some work on Paul Cezanne, and uh, Mr. Barnstone pointed out that was very interesting about Cezanne. In a number of his paintings, he began to experiment with brush strokes. So if he did a painting of a scene with a tree and shrubs and a building, the tree, the brown parts of the tree, got all of the brush strokes very carefully going like this. And then when he did the shrubs, the brush strokes went this way. And then when he started doing the building, even if there was different colors, he's doing the building with brush strokes like this. He's experimenting to see whether the, the control of brush stroke movements actually change or somehow impact things. And here I'm experimenting with horizontal lines, but what I want to show you is this line right here. This is a line that comes up and it meets the lily pad. It keeps coming up and it touches the lily pad, stops here. It keeps going and there's a petal from the flower blossom that's right here. Then it meets another petal, the flower, uh, the, the blossom, it stops right there. Comes up here and the lily pad is going to stop right here. And it keeps coming up. Well, there's a break. It comes up right here. Here's, here it is. No, where's my line? It follows up, it hits the pedal, and it comes all the way up to this blade of grass. Installing a line like this in your design is called a line of coincidence, and everywhere there's an interaction of things, where things coincide, is a point of coincidence. And when you start establishing these lines across a drawing and you establish points where things are coinciding, you're beginning to actually develop an architecture that changes the strength of your drawing. A line of coincidence, usually they're straight, but they can be curved. You could. These could be lines of coincidence. In drawing and design, the general rule regarding lines of coincidence is that they should contribute to the harmony of your design. In drawing and design, there are generally speaking four movements that artists make that occur in a design. The period, the arc, the straight horizontal line, and the vertical that changes in various directions. Nature gives us the period. We see that in spotted creatures. And the arc is everywhere in almost every living form. The straight line and the vertical are more of an artificial nature. We as artists, we create those things. 
And we provide, and, and any of these lines can be lines of coincidence. So lines of coincidence can be any arc or series of arcs, or any straight line or any series of straight lines, and they can be ellipses. Mr. Barnstone used to have a large white screen, and he would do a slideshow. That's how he taught. And he had shoot these slides, these images up onto the screen. He had a black marker, and he would go to work on them, showing us how the artist had actually determined how they, how they established, built the framework uh, of the design, the lines of coincidence, what have you. And one night, he started reviewing sculptures by 17th and 18th century Austrians, brilliant pieces of work, some bronze, and I think there was some stone. And when he started mapping the lines of coincidence, they were ellipses. They weren't even in parallel, necessarily. They just, there was just a movement that would seem to be among the Austrians, and they put their lines, their points of interaction, along these ellipses. The action of placing lines of coincidence and harmony with an obvious relationship like being in parallel with one another within the process of establishing your design is called the gamut. I'll say that again. The action of placing lines of coincidence within an obvious relationship, like in parallel, although this works too. I was doing some research on Pablo Picasso's Head of a Woman. I think it's 1909. And it's a Cubist work. Um, and uh, that's not enough. Let's get Picasso right. As I was searching for various images that might relate to Head of a Woman, it appears that I brought up one of his preparatory drawings. And he had this beautiful movement that this was at the top of the head that he was drawing. The eyes over here, nose over here, the mouth, although it's Picasso. Sometimes he put the two eyes there, but no, he had the eyes right. And he had this amazing flow on the head, and they were not necessarily in parallel, but there was a harmony in their movement. So we, we call this organization the gamut. Limiting the gamut is a common practice of making your design stronger because limiting the gamut gives greater organization and harmony to your design. See that? You see what we're working on there? So the question becomes, which is more ordered, which is, looks better to your eye? This or this? Now today, about 10% of the audience would say, oh, well, I like this. But in dynamic symmetry, this is the only thing we believe in. We don't believe in this. We believe in this. We're looking for harmony. We're looking for organization. We're looking for an architectural movement, a design. This is very unsatisfactory. This doesn't work for us. We're going to see shortly some uh, examples of a limited gamut by some master artists who focused on parallel lines. And in order to increase um, their design, they instituted 90 degree angles. In designing a rectangle, in designing a sculpture, with respect to dynamic symmetry, an artist has to create actually five drawings. A sculpture has five sides, front, back, right, left, and from up above, looking down. And when we start to organize these things, these uh, five sides, and we're doing the design work, the drafting, ideally, 
you can work with the lines of coincidence are going to wrap from side to side so that the front, the front has some relationship to the side. The side is going to bear some relationship to the back and then that relationship flows over here. And then from up above, ideally there is movement. So there's a great deal of work done to execute a sculpture. You've got to do five drawings if you're going to do it right. Um, so the next step then is to understand diagonals. I know I'm throwing an awful lot at you. It's all going to start to make sense when we start running through the images and then everything's going to start to click for you. So I, I thank you for your patience. Diagonals. The first is the central vertical. It goes through the middle of your rectangle, however it is. Along with the central vertical, we have the Baroque diagonal, and we have the sinister diagonal. The Baroque diagonal is a movement that begins in the lower left and rises to upper right. It can be at this angle, this angle, this angle. As long as it's past 90 degrees, coming this way, that's a Baroque diagonal. Sinister diagonal is exactly the opposite, rising from lower right to upper left. So you're a maritime uh, English artist and you want to paint a canvas of some men of war frigates, uh, large boats, uh, they're, they're battle boats in the sea, and the sea is rocking and everything is going on. The best way to handle that would be to install a sinister diagonal. So what you've got is, you've got the waves going like this, and you've got the ship like this bouncing around, and you put the moon up here, and the clouds are going like crazy, this whole thing is spewing, but the action, the activity, is going this way. And you're laying your lines of coincidence and as you're building your waves with your paint, you're approaching it in such a way that you're moving along these lines of coincidence and your sense of motion is going this way. So the first time I heard this, I raised my hand, I said to Mr. Barnstone, does anyone know why there is a sense of anxiety that you build when you do this? And he said, no, actually no one at Ruskin, no one at Oxford, no one could explain it psychologically. They just said, they, they, they lectured that there's a Baroque diagonal, a sinister diagonal, and a sinister diagonal gives a sense of anxiety. Um, I was um, judging one of the divisions out there early this morning, and someone did an owl. And uh, I was explaining to the other folks um, the, I, the reason I liked it was because whether the artist knew it or not, they had installed a sinister diagonal. They had this, this uh, owl, and they had the head over here, and they had the one wing out here, and the other wing was out here, and the motion was going this way. When you looked at this thing, this is how I saw the motion in that sculpture. And I, it worked very, very nicely. It developed a sense of anxiety. And finally, there is the, the complementary movement, the reciprocal, P-R-O-C-A-L.
There's the reciprocal movement. So when we're designing an image, we're going to draft, we're going to draw the picture of a, a sculpture that we're going to execute three-dimensionally. And we're going to install a Baroque diagonal like this with our points of coincidence falling along these lines. It's acceptable to draw reciprocals. And they don't have to be necessarily in boxes like that. You could have a reciprocal here, a reciprocal here. And, and what that does is it builds your architecture, your design, without increasing your gamut. I've got two motions going, this and this. Um, I have a painting that I had to break down by Vincent van Gogh and, uh, on a cypress tree. And he did the entire cypress tree in two movements. It, van Gogh was just pure genius. It was like this. This is how he built the whole tree. It came down like this. And then Van Gogh, he always worked with a, a loaded brush. He loaded a lot of paint in. And so he's painting and he loved these flowing movements. Van Gogh was very big on flowing movements. And so that was a cypress tree and that's how he applied the paint. It was really interesting the way he approached that. But he had just two movements, this way or this way. And he just kept repeating them. He was limiting his gamut and making the, the work very powerful as a result. Let's talk about that owl. I'm going to make a very rough drawing, so I hope you will not think ill of me. Okay, so uh, you're going to do an owl, and you want to increase the um, anxiety, the feeling, the sense of violence. Uh, and the thing's got, I hope I'm using the right word, talons? Is that what they have? Okay, I see someone nodding. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And so you've got the talons here, and you're going to carve a little creature that it killed. And that mouse or whatever is going to be at this angle. Sinister diagonal. That's what we're going to install, right? OK. All right, so we've got the angle here. And we've got feather patterns. You've got feathers going here, right? Now, you can handle this a couple of different ways. You can design some of these feathers so they're going this way to give the sense of wind blowing this way and the feathers are just lofting slightly and they're all going to fall, just happen to fall on your lines of coincidence. They become points of coincidence. Or you can take the feathers and you can split them so that this is coming here like this but there's a split here and the split sits on your line of coincidence. Then you come up here and the beak hits right here on the line of coincidence, which then the line then touches the eyeball of the owl. The break in the feathers, was this a horned owl or something? Uh, this owl has these uh, feathers sticking out. Um, and you begin to create a design on this bird where you're subliminally, almost subconsciously, you're relaying this motion that's flowing this way. Yes?
That was not good. I needed an hour or two to make it look good. <laughs> I'm a very slow worker. Let's see where we are here. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing good. Okay, this is, can you all see this? Um, this is the uh, Natural History Magazine, July 1992, page 59. The Temple of Karnak block exhibiting Queen Hatshepsut, 18th Dynasty, Ancient Egyptian. Um, and that's, just take a second. Um, we all know that libraries do not throw out books. They do throw out magazines. And so if you're interested in building a library of images, go to your library and say, you know, the, the National Wildlife, International Wildlife, National Geographic, all those magazines you've been throwing out, give them to me, please. Give me a call. Here's my business card. Here's my phone number. Call me when you're going to purge your magazines because I'm interested in some of your magazines. I have tremendous catalogs. I have boxes and boxes of you name the creature, you name the plant, you name the animal. I've got images on it, great images. And uh, so, uh, so I got my grocery bags from the library. I get them around Christmas time. They call me, Mr. Goldstein, come pick up your grocery bags. And I go, and uh, in the bag was Natural History Magazine. And uh, I saw this, and it just jumped right out at me. When you're working in dynamic symmetry, like me for the last 20 years, a lot of this stuff just jumps out at you. Queen Hatshepsut is moving this way. She's on an angle. She's on a Baroque diagonal. And I actually put the lines in. So these movements, these lines of coincidence, are designed. And so what the draftsman did, man or woman, there's no way of knowing who, um, the headdress, her, her, uh, her crown comes down here and it's right in line with the motion of her body with this leg and that's the dominant vertical so she's working, they're working in a Baroque diagonal, what we call today, you know, I don't know what it was called, 3000, some, or well, this is 1800, yeah, it's about, um, about 35, 3700 years ago I guess. And then these movements, these lines, are the reciprocals. So now what, what may have happened was the artist sits down with, I don't know, some papyrus and some charcoal and starts mapping this all out, then gets his or her lines into place, like here's the back of the thigh, falls right in that line, that reciprocal movement, and here it is in almost perfect parallel with the arm coming up, and um, they, you start moving things around. So you've got things where they need to be. So this cup is on that line. So that the, the steer, the horn, falls on that line, but then other things fall on that line as well, like, like the crown. And so you've got to move things around a little bit. And then once you've got it, then it's a matter of just going up to the stone wall and you start mapping everything out. That should have been a pretty interesting process. Now, the, the artist here had the stone cutter they may have been the stone cutter or they had stone cutters, so they had to supervise the stone cutting. And the depth appears to be about the same. I have another image I wish I had brought uh, that I got from the Metropolitan Museum. They've got this great Egyptian relief, and it's two baboons and they're facing each other, mirror images. Just the design is just beautiful. But the points of coincidence on the lines of coincidence, the draftsman requested that the stone cutters cut deeper into the stone because the draftsmen couldn't leave their name, that's a no-no, but wanted to let everybody know in history this was a person who knew what they were doing with regard to design. So they had the points of coincidence cut in a little bit deeper. So if you took a torch and you put it over like this, they popped and the lighting was just right in the, Met, in the Metropolitan Museum. And it was just, the effect was just amazing. But in this case, the draftsmen designed it and required that the cutting be pretty much the same, that it be uniform so that when the torches flashed or however the sun hit it or however it was seen, it was very balanced in its view. That's what he, was, he or she was trying to achieve. So she was, 
She lived from 1507 to 1458 BC. She was the fifth pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, came to the throne about 1478. This is believed to be 3,500 years ago. And my drawing of those water lilies occurred just a few years ago, and I did that. There's 3,500 years between us, and we're doing the same thing. It's interesting. This is a sculpture image from an article entitled Looking for Leonardo by Ann Landy. Uh, Smithsonian Magazine, October 2009, page 70 is where the article started. Uh, this was on a page and it didn't have a number on it. Uh, it gives the acknowledgement of Museo dell'Opera del Duomo, Florence, photo by Antonio Quattrone, 2009, and the design aspects are by Jay Goldstein. Um, so I'm paging through this magazine, again, one of the grocery bags, and I see this image and that foot just, just hit me. It just jumps right out. For someone who's trained in dynamic symmetry, that's a dead giveaway. You know this person was specifically designed. This is a 15th century master Italian work. The story is that this is a sculpture of a bunch of sculptures on a panel that's attached to, that's on a, um, uh, uh, been installed on an altar table at the Baptistery in Florence, Italy. And everybody thought it was Andrea del Verrocchio, who, I guess maybe the church even had this, the records, had the bill. So they knew it was Andrea del Verrocchio. The thing is that when the preservationists started going to work on this, they saw the obvious differences between this and another sculpture against all the other sculptures. They were, the style was obviously different. And um, the style of the others looked like Del Verrocchio. But this and the other one were much more refined. They were very different. And they were uh, very typical of the work of a young man working in Del Verrocchio's studio, a young man named Leonardo da Vinci. And so they felt that they had found these long lost da Vinci's. And I know Ann Landy, she wrote a great story. Ann uh, was very helpful in my career. Uh, she covered the Birds and Art exhibition at the Woodson Museum in Wisconsin back in 2009. And uh, she did that for the Wall Street Journal, Leisure and Arts section, hired her, sent her to Wausau, Wisconsin to cover that art show. And uh, she was fairly impressed with my sculpture, which you're gonna see later and um, wrote the story for the Wall Street Journal and the editorial board picked my sculpture as a um, sculptural highlight of the show. So uh, I love that woman, <laughs> she's great. <laughs> so she wrote this story and uh, whether it's Del Verrocchio or Da Vinci, and I'm inclined to agree with them that it's probably Da Vinci, but whether it is or it isn't is immaterial. Uh, what it is, is it's a great 15th century master Italian work. And uh, the exercise was to see the base construction, the base design, the first dynamics. You were looking at this the way the artist saw it. You think about that for a second. You're looking at this the way, if da Vinci did this, this is how, I can imagine Del Verrocchio going to him and saying, what I want you to do is to have a rectangle of a certain size and I want a certain theme and these are some ideas of what I have and then you go to it. And so the first thing that's got to be done is to establish what's known as Notional space. Notional space in the rectangle is where you're going to do, decide to actually do your drawing of your main subject. In this case, this warrior, is it here? Is it here? Uh, Edgar Degas, French Impressionist, he did a lot of painting of the ballet. He loved the ballet, he loved horse racing. 
And he's got this image. It's a very wide rectangle. Might be some rectangles stacked. He's got the ballet dancer up here. And she's reaching down, I think, to her toe shoes. And this is all hardwood. This is the hardwood floor. And he's got his subject up here. It's really interesting, the way he attacked that. Um, I looked at that and I thought, it's 15th century master Italian. It's a workshop. They don't have a lot of time to fool around. This rectangle is probably the elements of the exterior of the sculpture. So I boxed the sculpture, and what do you know? That falls on a line. That falls right on a line. This elbow falls on a line. This, these toes down here fall on a line. No question about it. That's my rectangle. That's the artist's. That's da Vinci's rectangle. The thing is that when I measure this axis, this is not a rectangle we recognize. Clearly, this rectangle is made of stacked or overlapped rectangles. My first guess, again, they don't have a lot of time to fool around. Just draw a dividing line and measure this axis. And when I did that, I got a root phi rectangle, perfectly right on the money. OK. So now we know that, let's say it was da Vinci. Da Vinci had this rectangle. He's got two rectangles. They're stacked. He's working in the root phi rectangle. The next thing I did was I drew the central vertical. And it's at the very top of the head, and it falls right against those toes. That makes it a line of coincidence. And along there, there's a change in the cheekbone. There's a change under the chin. Can you imagine the application that you have when you start putting, putting your lines on a bird, OK, and how you organize things? That's, how do you organize things? Let's say you're going to do two songbirds, right? So you're trying to figure out how you want to set them. How about you take the 90 degree angle, which a lot of artists use, and you're going to see some more images. And you cut that in half down to 45, and you put the body of the one bird here, put the male here, you put the female right here. Then you come back with a 90 degree angle, and the bird's head is going this way, the female, and the male's head is going this way. From up above, you are beginning to create a design. You're beginning to create an architecture. You're going to make your piece stronger. And you can almost figure out where the, the branches and the twigs have to go, just working with a 90 degree angle. If we're working here, we bring this 90 degree angle up like this. So these birds are sitting on a branch that's coming up like this. And then you want some twigs going out. You want the branch to continue. And the, and the bird is perched here. Take it that way and take it that way. This is under the birds. They're perched on the branch. And these branches relate to the movement of the heads. You now have a design. Now you're building strength in what you're doing. Da Vinci, what are you doing? So we've got the central vertical in. The next step is to figure out theme. Theme of three or theme of four. Now the central vertical doesn't change because in a theme of three, if you divide each of those sections in half, you have sixths. And three sixths is one half. So the central vertical is always the central vertical if you're in a theme of three or a theme of four. My guessing is, let's just divide this. Let's just assume it's a theme of four. And I put that line in, and it hits the hand like this. And it hits right along the hand. There's a break in the armor right here. Uh, da Vinci designed a movement over here, and it touches that right there. There's a swirling movement. It comes right down and touches the swirling movement. There's a break in the, the metal here, the, the, 
what's supposed to be a, some kind of a uh, fabric, a, like a dress, and then the line comes down, it touches the heel. It's a line of coincidence. So it's a theme of four. So then I just installed the other line, the other, and it turns out to be a line of coincidence. It goes in, in between the big toe and the second toe, beautifully, comes right up here, there's a break, comes up here, there's another break, another break, another break, there's another break. He's got his points all set. He's got his lines of coincidence. He's giving this a beautiful organization, base architecture. Now, um, he's working in a root phi rectangle. I put the axis in, and I see that that's a line of coincidence as well. And I come down and I throw a parallel, and it, the foot is sitting right on that line, perfectly. And then he's got the reciprocal movement right here, based at a 90 degree angle, which you see in a number of folks. He's doing the same thing. This line is in parallel to here, and it's going from the elbow right up. This head is perfectly perched inside these lines. It's, been, it's just beautifully designed. You're seeing that exactly the way da Vinci saw it as he was starting to put it together. This is uh, Theseus uh, battling with the centaur Bionor. This is uh, Antoine Louis Barry, and uh, it's bronze, 1867, Metropolitan Museum of Art, second floor, hallway outside the Impressionist galleries, Annenberg galleries. Look at what Barry is doing. Working in a sinister diagonal, wants to heighten the sense of anxiety, just as you might want to do with a predator, with a hawk or an owl or something that kills things. He's creating the same kind of anxiety that you would want to do. He's got this hammer here, and it's just a really beautiful work, Metropolitan Museum. This was done by a young man who studied under Barry, and his name was Auguste Rodin. And this is about 100 feet from the other sculpture. Look at how beautifully Rodin lays the finger, the foot, all in these beautiful lines of coincidence, working in 90 degree angles, nice and squared positions. Uh, it's just, it's a brilliant work. And he's working in a sinister diagonal. It's Adam, he's reflective, maybe not too happy, contemplating something that might not be such good news from God. Who knows? <laughs> You're seeing this sculpture exactly the way Henri Matisse saw this sculpture. This is um, Reclining New Two, again at the Metropolitan Museum, 1927. Matisse is working in just two movements. It's really genius. It's so simple, and it's brilliant. This is Heracles the Archer by Emile Antoine Bourdel. Bourdel spent, apparently, according to information on the computer, Wikipedia, he may have spent some time in Rodin's studio. And he does this beautiful work. He's got these 90-degree angles, but the bow is off. And I had a chance to talk to the curatorial folks at the Metro Metropolitan Museum. This is on the first floor in their sculptural, uh, the large room where the Burgers of Calais by Rodin are. And it was a wintry day. And, but I didn't see that mismovement until I got home, had the images reproduced, and then the bow just jumped out at me. And it's really kind of interesting. Why did Bordell do that? This is so well organized. Why is that bow off? Is it an outlier? Or did he design it that way? And I talked to the curatorial folks at the Metropolitan Museum. I've come to the conclusion he meant for it to be that way. He executed this in 1909. And that was a time in Paris when there was a great uproar and they were just throwing off the shackles of design. And he may have had one foot in the past and one foot in the future. And we'll never know. And this is stilts. This is the... Uh, Sculpture that Ann Landy talked about with the Wall Street Journal. Um, and there's no lines. Look at it for a second. Do you see the lines? How about this beak, this leg, and this leg? Do you see it? This head is turned this way. This head is the mirror image. Do you see it? This and this are mirror images. The hidden central vertical is right here. And these legs fall 
as points of coincidence on that design. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Uh, it's been a real privilege to be able to give it. I don't know what you may take away from this presentation, but I hope you'll recall the words, or words of Kenyon Cox, that without design, there may be representation, but there can be no art. Thank you very much. <laughs>